okay you fans here we go I haven't been in there since they cleaned it up but the last time I went where Earl Stanley Gardner wrote Perry Mason and where they uh, the uh, the former offices of Sheridan or in Drapeau. Uh it was it was vacant last time I was there there was a little legal office opposite to it so I hope they don't uh, make a fuss and throw us out I'll be kind of quiet but the problem is right across the street as luck would have it you can't even hear because they're they're uh, doing some kind of construction so I'll slip in we'll try to go up to the third floor where uh, we're on uh, Earl Stanley Gardner's off time waiting for clients to come in where he wrote Perry Mason hopefully we can get a good shot and there won't be anybody to intrude now right here like I said here are the uh, here's the fourth generation and there's a painting of him in there and uh, Mr. Orr said a lot of people clients come in they see that painting and they don't even know who it is and nor do they ask but uh, here you go this is the uh, fourth generation of uh, Gardner Orr in Drapeau and this is what it became Benton Orr Duval in Buckingham and he started uh, uh, in that law firm in 1921 like I said before and then they moved to this building when it was built in 1926 to the third floor so uh, here you go good Friday a lot of tourists there's tourists here all the time but on this Friday morning there tends there there seems to be more than usual this town was founded 236 years ago uh, to the date tomorrow in 1782 it was built by Father Junipero Serra, the mission, if you will, and then the town built up around it. And uh, it has an old mission, like I said, and I, they built the mission in 1809. So if you're at all interested, you can come and you can take a tour. They got a museum in there. Now, if they're going to make a museum the way I look at it, why not on the third floor where Earl Stanley Gardner's original offices were? Seriously. But like I said, last time I went, they were vacant. And uh, I think, I don't even know if they turned those into lofts or what. So at least we don't need a security key to get in. I checked the door already. Here's a little shot, a little roundabout shot here in Old Ventura. And uh, incidentally, if you're a big uh, Johnny Cash fan, this is where he lived in the late 50s until he left his first wife. And uh, this was uh, Johnny Cash, the man in black, stomping grounds for a couple of years. And his three daughters graduated. Rosanna Cash and her two sisters, they graduated from uh, Ventura High School. Okay, here we go. It's, uh, this building is Renaissance Revival. And uh, it was the first national bank and I think it said there there have been 21 banks in all, all those years and uh, I'm gonna take the uh, stairway I'm not gonna take the uh, that old rattle trap God forbid it gets stuck but here's the plaque that I was telling you fans about right here historic point of interest number 86 Earl Stanley Gardner's law office let me get a shot of this first okay they just put that up that wasn't there Earl Stanley Gardner office building at least they're they're signifying the place that he once was here Earl Stanley Gardner's Gardner's law office Gardner 1889 to 1970 pattern the office of his character Perry Mason after his own office and suite 306 of this building Gardner, a resident of Ventura until 1933, is cited by the Guinness Book of World Records as the number one best-selling author of all time. This plaque was provided in Mr. Gardner's memory by his wife, Mrs. Jean Gardner. 
His daughter, Grace Nossel, his secretary, Ruth Sophia Moore. Ruth was uh, Gene's sister. The Downtown Lions Club, he, uh, he did found that. He helped found the Lions Club. Earl Stanley Gardner did. John Anthony Miller, that guy I was telling you about, he's a big fan. And the building owners, Mr. and Mrs. James Brucker. De designated February 6, 1995 by the City of San Buenaventura Historical Prevention Committee. Now right here, before I go in, that van, John Anthony Miller, they've been wanting the city, the community uh, services, they've been wanting them to, ne uh, to designate this Dallas Street, pun intended, this alley for what it's worth. They want to at least put a name on it. As you can see, it's got a rest and aspiration alley. Okay, so they want to name it after uh, Dallas Street, and that that character from the book was played by Barbara Hale, who left us at age 94 in uh, last January, January of 2017. Okay, let's go in. Raymond Burr was a quintessential Perry Mason. And if you've ever read the books, they couldn't have got an exact duplicate of the fictional Perry Mason. In fact, uh, Earl Stanley said he was the perfect, perfect choice. Okay, here you go. Okay, here you go. You fans, right here. Here's the directory. Okay, let's see now. 306, it says neighborhood, so. And then uh, they did fix it up, it's clean. All this uh, tile work, this looks like it's been re re renewed. This isn't the original tile. And I just want to say right here that uh, Perry Mason, he, uh, his office is modeled after Will Stanley Gardner's, but a lot of the uh, activity on the outside took place in downtown Los Angeles. And here's that, and too bad they changed that. It was original from 1926. I can't believe they did that. And, um, Shocked that I didn't get it before they uh, ruined it and modernized it. It looked exactly the way it did in 1926. Okay, let's go up and let's go up to the uh, Earl Stanley Gardner's offices, but of course Perry Mason's. And uh, if you can suspend your disbelief and imagine Earl Stanley Gardner from 1926 to 1933 locking up these stairs and co cogitating his plots and his ideas of for his first book. The case of the Velvet Claws. Okay, here's the first floor. And, uh, okay, well, they, they redid the doors. As you can see, they cleaned them up. Let's hope I can get in there. This is the second floor, actually. I actually thought the first floor first uh, story started above the first floor so or rather the ground floor but okay then here's the third floor okay let's go here let's hope they don't say anything okay 306 okay imagine Paul Drake this Drake detective agency adjacent to uh, the fictional Perry Mason and going in through the, the secret door, that would have been probably 304. That would have been the door he would have walked in. And uh, Drake Detective Agency, it was supposed to be adjacent. And uh, then you'd walk in, in the fictional Perry Mason's offices. You'd have Gertie at the switchboard. And then you had another office with Dallas Street. Okay, look at this. Okay, well they did fix this up because this was all open last time I came. There was an office opposite. And uh, here's the exit. The stairway, I mean. Well, it says exit, but it's just a room. Okay, this right here, you fans all over the world, the Perry Mason, and of course his author, Earl Stanley Gardner. This is where he wrote one of the most famous characters in literature of the 20th century in these rooms right here okay now 
Let me see, where was 306? I remember it was right here last time it came. came. That's 305, here's 306. Okay, here's 306, right here. Okay, maybe they flipped it around. And... Okay. Okay, well, we're not gonna be able to get in, you fans. But here you go, you fans all over the world. The offices of the fictional Perry Mason. They said that in uh, Japan, his books are still selling by the millions. In Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, the agents for William Morrow are still uh, getting contracts to sell Perry Mason books, still in a lot of countries. And his estate that was run by his wife who died in 2002, age 100, Jean, she took care of his estate, his memorabilia, the licensing, the image. And I think that's why he didn't, he didn't divorce his first wife until she died, because he knew that Jean was the expert, her and her sisters, but more Jean was the, was a, was a complete and total expert on all the uh, Perry Mason lore. So she would have known if they were doing whatever they were do, doing the TV show, or they were doing any type of uh, fictional writing of Perry Mason, she would have known if they were completely out of character. So I think that's why he left her the estate, of course, having married Jean. And then she had her two sisters. And they're still going, the family's still going through uh, boxes, files, and they're still finding stories that uh, Earl Stanley, he did want to publish, or he had forgotten about. They're still uh, finding stories, and they're publishing them. And like I said, because of Jean, well, she died in 2002, but I would suppose either his daughter or maybe, maybe Ruth took over. I don't know. I don't know who's uh, in charge of the estate. But I think that anything that's ever been published or if anybody has any interest, it's already been uh, put out there. And how much more can you stretch it? When you want when you got a winning horse running around the track why stop and change horses right okay here you go you fans pretty pretty much original there was a bar and a restaurant that he still liked to eat and uh, as you can see the old awnings the old uh, fire uh, fire escapes right here the terraces I mean pretty much this was his stomping grounds when he got ideas on his lunch breaks, if you can suspend your disbelief and see him, Earl Stanley Gardner in 1930, getting ideas, taking a break, a smoke break, going to the, his local watering hole, getting ideas. And then here you go, the new modern era is impinging on the old, on the old part, but at least they're, they're able to have prescience enough and respect for the heritage of Ventura and America to keep the old buildings. And Hollywood, you, you people that run that place, you ought to take note and you ought to clean everything up and retrofit it and just fix it up and respect the memory and the heritage and the lore of America instead of letting everything be boarded up and rotted away. And I know that's private property in Hollywood, but they can pass ordinances to fix everything up okay I want to say right here that uh, okay. <laughs> we're going to do Earl it. Stanley Gardner when he graduated from Palo Alto High School in 1909 he went to a school called Val Valparaiso University in Indiana and that was actually called at that time the the poor man's Harvard because it was it was the second largest school in America at the time he went to law school there and he got kicked out because he was spending more time boxing and uh, he was acting up, goofing off all the time. They threw him out. He came back west where his family lived over here. Having moved from uh, Malden, Massachusetts where he was born, I guess in the, in the first uh, decade of the 20th century. And uh, when he graduated and I told you he came back, he came back from Indiana 
he got into it all a law firm with an old gentleman lawyer who had him read for the law taught himself precedent taught him, him taught himself case law with the help of that old lawyer and then he passed the bar in 1911 got married to his his wife whom he met in his first office in Merced California that was his secretary he married her her name was I said uh, her name was Natalie and they had a daughter they got married now uh, he was like I said he was a legal genius now I'll give you an example of what he did uh, after he got bored in Merced he moved to uh, Oxnard California now back in those days I guess around 1913 14 right before the World War